Hello, everyone. My name is Richard Gould. I'm a senior fellow at CG and also a professor in the Faculty of Law and Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at McGill University. And I'm really pleased to be here today, not to give you anything substantive, but to introduce the leader of CG all these uh, past years, Rohinton Medora. Since 2012, Rohinton has been CG's president. And in that position, he has transformed the organization from a local conglomeration of experts to one of the world's top unaffiliated and independent think tanks, which is an amazing accomplishment in just 10 years. While Rohinton did not obviously do this alone, he benefited from great staff, dedicated set of fellows, including myself, if I can count myself, and the strong and active uh, board and funders, he steered the organization into the image of himself as a thoughtful, engaged, truthful, and empirically driven organization. Holding a doctorate in development economics and with a promising academic career ahead, Rohinton moved into service, rising to be vice president of the Canadian government's premier development program, the International Development Research Centre. And drawing on those experiences, he managed to marry the worlds of academia without a policy to create in CG a unique venue in the Canadian landscape, a think tank without a political affiliation, drawing on academics and experts, not only from Canada, but internationally to provide empirically based policy recommendations that demonstrate the variety of views and options, not just a single point of view. None of CG's competitors in Canada can claim half as much, and that is due to Roe Hinton's efforts. Over the last year, Roe Hinton has pivoted CG to examine global governance issues raised by digital technologies. One of the key issues uh, that he and CG have raised is how do we develop mechanisms to ensure that digital technology and large data sets are harnessed to serve global health and the global good? And an aspect of that that's close to my heart is his work and emphasis on public control, open data, and open science. And while the world began the COVID pandemic sharing and uh, being open, we soon degraded, unfortunately, into hoarding and profiteering, with the result that only 11% of those in low-income countries have been vaccinated. And we are collectively left with a pandemic with no end in sight, because we did not have in place the mechanisms to ensure that sharing would be in place and solve those problems. Rohinton was a member of the Lancet Financial Times Commission governing Health Futures 2030, which was published last, or published its report last October. And it is that work, uh, both within CG and with the Lancet Financial Times, that informs his present uh, presentation today. So I give you someone who I greatly admire, not because just because of his leadership and intelligence, but because beyond all else, he's a match, a person of integrity and honor. I give you Rohinton Medora. Richard, thank you for those very generous words. And uh, in, in some ways you've kind of set the stage uh, so well for why CG and the University of Waterloo and all of us are here today, which is to sort of talk about a very leading edge issue. And if there's one reason we can do so, I should say it's because of the contributions of, uh, of, uh, of people like you, and especially you. And I followed your work over the years and learned so much from it. Um, as Richard said, what I thought I'd do in my few minutes is talk a bit about some of the things that drove our work on the Lancet FT Commission. Uh, and then go beyond it to reflect in three layers, actually, on what this means for the topic of this conference, which is um, creating good uh, digital health data systems, if you will, and what are the sort of policy and action issues around that. If I had to sort of motivate some of the work we're doing, especially internationally, this is a slide that sort of shows you the correlation between child mortality and access to the internet internationally. You know, it's correlation, not causality. I get that. But it is still a striking correlation. And effectively, what it says is that the less connected a country is, 
the higher is the mortality of its children, which actually is a leading and, and very contextual indicator for many other aspects of development. So that's one. If we then sort of look at access to the internet in different parts of the world, what you find is that the global average is only 33%. And just within developing countries, it ranges from a high of about 60% in Eastern Europe and Central Asia to 5% in parts of Africa. So the digital divide is very much here. It's very much present. And clearly, it should be playing out in different outcomes. So I come back to my point that correlation is not causality. But even if you sort of don't buy into that fully, take a look at how it is that digital technologies can alter health outcomes. I would think of this as being governed by four poles, and that's the four ends of the slide. You need the physical digital infrastructure, hugely important. You need a governance and legal system for it. There is, broadly speaking, the political economy of innovation, which, as Richard pointed out, is playing out in spades with the COVID vaccine. And then you've got a sort of social context that has to do with rights. And I'd like to come back to that in a second as well. And so the interaction between digital technologies and health outcomes actually happens within that larger framework, which is legal, social, cultural, and economic. Uh, digital technologies obviously have a direct impact on health outcomes and understanding of health. And we can think of ways in which distance health and, and uh, speeds of waiting time and, and other ways uh, alter health outcomes directly. But perhaps equally important, if not more so, it might be the indirect impacts that digital technologies have through social, commercial, political, and environmental organizations that alter health. And so this is why I think the point about correlation is not causation has to be nuanced because in fact, the correlation may be simple, but it's hugely complex. And since this is a university-based conference, I would say that this slide alone holds, you know, uh, a couple of dozen PhD theses. And there's a lot of multi-level analysis that has to be done to tease out these various outcomes. But the very broad early phase of this work suggests to me that the indirect impacts of technologies on health would be at least as important as the direct impacts. And so when you think of the driving force of global health, at least, which is universal health coverage and so equity in health and well-being, it has to be situated in a much larger set of social, political, and economic issues, which is what this diagram tries to portray. And this, in many ways, was the context within which uh, the Commission did its work. I'd next like to move to what this means actually for policy and for activity. And I, I, I do this in three layers, if you will. I'd like to talk a bit about the overall approach that countries or societies take to new technology and then move to data and then move to sort of government policy per se. But I begin, and I've said this before and written about this, that if we're going to get to equitable and efficient health data systems and equitable and efficient and ideal health outcomes. The first thing we need is social norms around new technologies. And in the past, I've made the point that just as the world has coalesced around the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which not everyone you know, buys into fully, but we still have, bought, have signed on to it, we're at the stage where we need a global compact on how technologies operate and why, how and how and why we view them. Uh, the G20 has done some work on this. The OECD has, different groups have, but I think the starting point has to be to formalize all of that and understand what kinds of ethics norms and processes we expect around technology and what technology does for us. And then here I, I think a lot of um, the point that actually Vivek made um, in his keynote yesterday, which is that a lot of the challenges in digital health are not technical, but they're policy challenges. And he made the same point this morning and I um, earlier uh, at the, at, in the opening, and I, I fully subscribe to that. Uh, the second element of that compact has to be what kinds of ethical standards do we expect of emerging technologies and can and should they be baked in at the innovation stage? Uh, it's not enough 
to have a technology emerge and then scramble to control it. There have to be sort of guidelines through which this happens. This increasingly is the case, certainly with biotechnology, where you have ethical norms within which researchers operate. It is frankly not the case with digital technologies more broadly, in which it is still a bit of a free for all when it comes to what you do, how you do, and so on. And so the third and final point, uh, as we move towards big data and machine learning, and as more and more decisions are taken for us or guided strongly by algorithms, is that we're going to have to move to a regime in which there is some transparency around algorithms and some accountability eventually of algorithms. So if I run a billion dollar business, my books are audited. If I run a billion dollar business, of which you know $980 million is accounted for by uh, value by algorithms, no one's looking at my algorithms. Uh, maybe they should be. And so if algorithms are almost a factor of production, then we have to treat them that way. And we're not there yet, but I think uh, when it comes to health data especially, this is where uh, the, the, the policy direction might be going. Speaking of data, the next sort of set of thoughts has to do with data governance. And here I'd say, and again, uh, many of you know much more about this than I do, but we're at the very early stages of harnessing big data and making it meaningful. Now, again, someone said yesterday that we have oceans of data and deserts of analysis, and that's exactly right. And so the first step has to be to create open databases that mean something. Um, one way forward is so-called data trusts and data cooperatives. So think of it as a club in which groups of individuals or entities um, pool their data and have a common framework for how it should be used, how it's stored, how it's an anonymized. And then the fruits of that, you might think of that as dividends, whether they're financial or social, that go back to the owners of the club or the members of the club. And so I think borrowing from the financial sector analogy, uh, data trusts are one way to go forward. And actually, um, you know, in Canada, for example, provinces where most of the health uh, oper operationalization happens um, hold reams and reams of data, which we haven't begun harnessing uh, for social or economic purposes. And you might think of, of a provincial health database as a data trust and then take it from there. We certainly need more common protocols around how data is gathered, why it's gathered, how it's stored, how it's aggregated, and then how it's put to use. And the final point I'd make on this is especially, again, sort of deriving from the COVID-19 analogy uh, and the apps that, that uh, data is not something that is value-free, and it's especially not value-free because of its uh, traceability. And so there's a privacy, security, human rights nexus of issues that has to be sorted out. And we're not going to be confident in giving up or giving away our data or having it used in this data trust form if we didn't have confidence in the authorities that use it. And so that's a hugely complex issue on which uh, we have to be making headway. And then I'll end my, my brief of remarks by talking a bit about what this means for public investment and public policy. And I guess the first point I'd make is as with the creation of the internet um, a generation or now two generation, uh, generations ago, this is going to have to be a public-private partnership. There's going to be pipes and there's going to be content. Um, pipes typically involve increasingly the private sector. The content in some ways belongs to us all. And so the regulatory and financial regime around how we create the pipes and content and structure around health data is one of those of emerging fields in, in both national, subnational, and global finance, as well as governments more broadly. It involves transforming some public sector roles, right? So increasingly someone who's a health technician or someone who's working in distance health will also have to be fluent in aspects of the governance of data. And the final point I'd make is that all of this, if we get it right, holds huge promise, especially for the marginalized parts of the world, the marginalized parts of this country,
and precisely the groups that I was alluding to at the start in terms of what this means for the benefits. So the benefits go much beyond remote health access and delivery. I think there's tremendous benefits from having larger and larger pools of data for gene-based research and for other aspects of inquiry. But I do think that the um, benefits are there if we're willing to incur the cost. And the cost is not a small one, as Vivek and I point out in an op-ed we did a couple of days ago, but the cost of not doing anything is even higher. And that cost is going to be either you lag behind when it comes to health outcomes, or you have a bit of a Wild West phenomenon in which there is no governance of the field, which leads very rapidly to uh, diminutions in public confidence. And so for all those reasons, um, I think we should be thinking about this in systematic ways. And I know many of us and many of you are. Thank you very much. Thank you.